Okay, we're almost done. However, um, you've now been through this whole publishing process. You and the journal both agree that this is a good paper, and you both agree that you want it published. Here's where you and the journal may have somewhat differing uh, goals and objectives and hopes. Um, at some point in this process, you will be asked to sign a copyright transfer agreement or a publication agreement. And I would urge you to think about this process very, very carefully. When you create an intellectual product, it's yours. When you have an idea, it's yours. When you publish it, you're essentially opening that idea to the broader public. And the question is, how do you open that idea to the broader public? How do you, uh, in some sense, give up the exclusive ownership of that idea? What we've been talking about in this whole module is giving up that exclusivity by means of working with a journal. Okay, and the journal then has to have the, the uh, privilege or the opportunity to publish your idea. So in that sense, we have to do something about transferring or opening the copyright, because otherwise that idea is yours. So the first question is, what is copyright? What does that ownership um, constitute? Well, copyright is a set of, of rights. It includes the right to reproduce the work, to adapt it, to distribute it, perform it, and display it. Okay, this is legalese. But think very carefully about all of these things. You want to share your work with uh, colleagues. You want to send somebody a, a, a version of your paper. You want to uh, give a presentation of your research. Maybe it's your final thesis presentation. Well, that's essentially a performance or a display of your work. And then you may want to write a follow-up paper. Maybe you want to write one of those long and complex papers reviewing your whole body of work. That's an adaptation. So these are important rights to you as a scientist. So at the end of this publication process, you get something like this, publication agreement. This is one with quarterly review of biology. And notice that there are a lot of words there. It's usually in legal language. I will bet that the majority, or even the great majority of the people watching this video who've published a paper have never read this agreement. Well, I would urge you to read this agreement. So let's look at some of them. This is a pretty positive agreement with, with Quarterly Review of Biology. Uh, you're allowed to deposit a copy of the contribution in the data repository maintained by your institution. Uh, after an embargo period and providing that all of the relevant conditions have been met. Uh, grants to you the following non-exclusive rights, subject basically to your giving credit. So you're saying this is a paper that was published in the Quarterly Review of Biology, and here it is. Anybody and everybody can have access to it. That's pretty good. Here's another one. I've, I've expanded the critical part. Uh, it's for the University of California Press for a paper published in the OCK, the Bird Journal. Um, author reserves the rights, which is to say doesn't give up the copyrights, to use his or her article in the following ways. Uh, we have to give the citation, and we don't sell it in a way that would conflict with the business interests of the society. But we can use the article for educational classroom or research uses. We can publish it, essentially republish it in a book or anthology. We can post it on our personal websites or our institutional or subject repositories. Uh, and we can post it with our funding archive. So this is not bad also. 
but now we're going to start looking at ones that are worse. So here we're with the Raffles Bulletin of Zoology. Uh, it is agreed that in transferring copyright, the author retains the right to use the substance of this work in future works. Okay, that's good. Provided that acknowledgement is made to prior publication in the journal, that's okay. Then, however, the publisher waives the copyright to the author to allow photocopies for their distribution. I don't know what that meant. And the funny thing was, I asked the editor, and the editor didn't know what that meant either. So sometimes um, you really have to think about what is being said. Let's go to a still worse example. Here's an example with the American Journal of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. And this is really a fairly pathological example. My signature certifies that I assign the copyright to the society. The society will have the exclusive right of publishing, disseminating, and get this, disposing of the article throughout the world. The author cannot grant the right to print, publish, copy, or store any part of the article to anybody without previous written consent from the society. So this is a good journal. We're all happy and proud when we can publish there, but this is a really, really restrictive agreement. In theory, at least, once you publish at the American Journal of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, you can't do much with what was your intellectual property after that. The American Journal of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene is far from the only example of this. This is simply one example of a really bad copyright transfer agreement. Um, this is why I want you to read these agreements. Figure out and understand what it is you're doing with your intellectual property. So why do we care? Does it really matter who owns a particular contribution. Ideally, everybody can read what we publish, right? What's the root of the word publication? Um, it's not always that way. So to give you an example, here's a paper that I published a few years ago in an uh, international journal published by Springer. And I was sitting in a coffee shop and I needed to consult my own publication. And I searched for it in Google, and I come to this page. Access to this resource is secured. And it, I can add this item to my shopping cart for purchase. And guess what? It costs $34. Is that really how we want to do our scientific communication? I don't think so. Let's think about it more. First of all, let's have a reality check. If you're at a university, your university probably provides you electronic access to some set of journals. If you're at a really big university, it may be all of the journals. And if you're at a really tiny university, it may just be a small number. That access is not usually free. Um, in fact, this is a, a, a survey between 1986 and 2006, so 20 years, of uh, serial expenditures in uh, a set of libraries in North America. And what I want you to see is this is uh, fixed at the 1986 value as a beginning, and then this is a percent change since 1986. And I want you to see this curve. Serial expenditures have increased. 321% since 1986. So this costs real money. It's like that $34 for my article, but this is your institution paying big bucks for access to everybody's publications. Um, the University of Kansas spends four and a half million dollars every year in getting me and my colleagues the access that we need in order to do the science that we do. Each one of your institutions spends some amount of money to get you some degree of uh, access to the literature, 
And if they don't spend money, then you're going to be out in the cold and you're going to have to type in your credit card number to get access to some of the scientific literature. So let's talk about the scientific process, okay? You have a good idea, a research idea. And you find some way to be able to do that project. Maybe you write a proposal and get a grant, or maybe your institution pays you uh, your salary, but somebody has to fund your time and your effort and your materials to do that research. You do the research. We've been talking for the past uh, couple of hours about writing the paper. Then you submit the paper to the journal, the editor re receives it, the reviewers consider it, the editor accepts it. We've just talked about this a lot in, in the remainder of this module. Sometimes, especially in parts of the sciences, you pay page charges. And finally, your paper is published. And that kind of ought to be the end of the process, but it isn't. So, where do we go from here? Well, somebody pays subscription fees. That's your university and my university and everybody's university or institute or institution around the world. Or, you're paying for article by article access fees. So notice that there are three points at which somebody's paying some money. So let's take a moment and think about the inputs into this, into this system. At several points in this system, your brain power and the editor's brain power and the reviewer's brain power gets involved. So you guys are contributing intellectually to this process. That research funding is not brain power, it's money power. And also, by the way, you know, your salary and the editor's salary and the reviewer's salary, those are being paid by some institution somewhere. So we can imagine a lot of money flowing into this system, and we can imagine a lot of brain power flowing into this system. Now, we get one thing out of it, we get the publication. Where does the money go? So we have put money in, in terms of research funding, in terms of the editor's time and the reviewer's time. But where does the money go? Well, somebody's taking that money and running away with it, and this money and running away with it. That somebody, increasingly frequently, is the commercial publisher. Many people see this in academia as a major problem. Why? Because all of this input that's from within academia flows out into very profitable commercial enterprises. Let me show you what I mean by that. This is a summary of the 10 companies that make more money online than Facebook. Essentially, this is a summary of how much money is being made by internet-based businesses. And obviously, the big winner is Google. Okay, Google has come to be a dominant force in the market. But I want you to notice, number four on the list is Elsevier, one of the big commercial publishers, and also one of the big commercial publishers that has the worst um, policies as far as access to what it publishes. Also in here is Thomson Reuters, which also makes a lot of money off of academic publishing. I'm going to show you this problem in a different way. As an experiment, I took 10 publications by my colleagues here at the University of Kansas, each one in a different journal. And I sent the, this citation of each of those 10 publications to colleagues around the world. And I asked them, simply, go to your office and see if you can see this paper. See if you can get the PDF of this paper in front of you on your desktop. Here are the results. Only two of my colleagues were able to get access to every single one of those papers. Both of them were in Europe. But notice that even in the US, not to mention across the rest of the world, nobody was, nobody was able to get universal access to all those papers. So somebody's papers are getting left out.
and not getting read and not getting cited. And that's because, in large part, of this commercial dimension, this money-making dimension to academic publishing. We can look at the results of this same experiment by journal. Very interesting, the highest uh, access rate was for commercial journals, systematic biology, molecular biology and evolution, nature, ecology. And the lowest were for society journals in general. Um, but notice that some of these journals, fewer than half of my colleagues around the world could get access to them. We have one that's two that are at 41.2% success rate. Fewer than half of my colleagues were able to go to a paper in Herpetologica and get access to it. That's a problem. Academic communication, scholarly communication is not working. So I will simply state my opinion, and you can take it for what you would like to make of it. Academic publishing has been bought out by an opportunistic commercial publishing world and is fast becoming inaccessible to the academic community and particularly to the global academic community. That's my opinion, but I think, I think if you think carefully about what I'm saying to you, you'll agree. Now it's not just all negatives, which is to say if, if everybody could get access to every paper that he or she needs to do his or her work, there's also a positive side to opening access. Um, here's a paper by, uh, published by the University of Southampton reviewing citation advantage of open access. And essentially what they find is that in every field, with one very minor exception, in every field, a paper that is openly accessible gets cited more. So, for example, in physics and astronomy, a paper that is openly accessible gets cited 1.7 to 5.8 fold more frequently. In biology, which was the only exception, we have one study, this is a study of studies, uh, one study found a slight disadvantage, but most of the studies found uh, an advantage. These numbers will be evolving as more and more open access journals become available and get to high impact stature. But a very detailed literature now documents that open access publications get cited more. So this is not just a negative, it's also a positive to you. You want your work to be seen by your colleagues and appreciated by your colleagues, get it into an open access journal. So when we talk about open access, what are we talking about? Well, let me give you some qualities of it. Open access literature is digital, online, free of charge, and free of most licensing restrictions. I mean, obviously, probably we want people to cite our work and not simply to use it, okay? Don't have to have that, but we, we would probably like people to cite our work. Open access becomes possible thanks only to the internet and some sort of agreement from the person or enterprise that owns the copyright. Remember, that's what you transferred when you uh, signed that publication agreement. Because scholarly journals don't pay authors, we scholarly authors can agree to open access and not lose money the authors, the academics. I think this goes without saying, but open access is completely compatible with peer review. Uh, essentially all major open access initiatives insist on uh, peer review. But here's the critical point. Open access literature is not free. The goal is to make accessing the literature cost free. But somebody does have to pay for the publication process. So this is a set of challenges that we as academics need to think about. So solution number one is publish in completely open access journals. And so these are open access journals that have found some way to cover the costs of access without this subscription barrier. Okay? Um, Open access journals increasingly 
are high impact journals and have high circulation. So this is one of the most um, obvious and ideal solutions to this problem. And indeed you can go to the directory of open access journals uh, www.doaj.org and you can search for journals that have good open access policies um, in your area. So this is, this is uh, essentially how you find those open access journals in your area. So a second solution is essentially to work within the limits, which is to say stay within the commercially published um, journal literature. But you can uh, look for the journals and the publishers that have better um, policies, things that you agree with. So you can go to Sherpa Romeo, which is a website that um, is a, essentially provides access to a database about publication policies of journals. And you can see that these nice green check marks. Author can archive a preprint before refereeing. Author can archive a post print, print post refereeing. Um, so this is this is a reasonably good journal as far as um, access policies. Let's look at another example. Here's a a journal where we see a red X and we kind of don't want to see that. Author cannot archive publisher's version or the PDF. You can archive a pre-refereeing version. A lot of us would say we want to see the version that's been peer reviewed. Uh, so this is a, a, a middle line journal as far as acceptability. And then finally we get to some journals that are just flat out unacceptable. No preprint, no postprint. Uh, essentially, the the journal holds copyright and won't let go. So, a, a second solution to this open access challenge is vote with your papers and send your papers to the journals that have appropriate um, policies about access to your work. So a final solution, albeit a partial one, is to work to change. And so here I had a paper, I hereby assign the copyright of this material to the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, which we've already talked about, and say I disagreed with this piece of the copyright transfer agreement, and so I marked it out and I signed it. And that's how I returned the copyright transfer agreement to the publisher. The publisher can say no, and then you will have to either accept their terms or withdraw the paper. And probably at this stage, you're going to accept their terms. But you can essentially work to change the, the, the system. Uh, many institutions, the University of Kansas included, many institutions are developing institutional policies that argue for uh, open access, essentially saying that we as professors at the University of Kansas grant to the University of Kansas a license to serve a copy of our work openly via the internet. Again, the publisher can say no, and you're going to have to make some difficult decisions. But, um, but I tell you this simply so that you see that there are solutions, there are ways in which you can work to change the, the, the system.